you have asked me to speak on the topic of the riches of the knowledge of God, I fall almost immediately of this uh, passage I'm going to read in Philippians 3, verses 4 to 11. I love the Paul that writes these words because he writes here personally and emotionally about the same issues that he writes about theologically and more theoretically in the epistle to the Romans. Follow along with me as I read uh, verses 4 through 11. If anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. The circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness faultless. But whatever was to my profit, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss compared to the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of mine own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God, it is by faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, so somehow to attain to the resurrection from the dead. Amen. Amen. I know that I am known, that my life is complete. I know I have found what some of me have dreamed. I hold in my heart the pearl of great price. Dear Lord, hear my cry. I want to know Christ. I know that my path is the way of the cross. So I count what I've gained and forget what I've lost. In pain there is joy. In death there is life. Dear Lord, hear my cry. I want to know Christ. I want to know Christ. I keep him before me. I lift up my eyes. I drink in his glory. I press toward the goal. His goodness unfold. March on with my soul. I want to know Christ. And the things that entangle me, I lay them down. All the treasures and trophies of life. Let them be lost. Only let me be found in Christ. I want to know Christ. Amen. What is valuable to you? What are riches to you? What is wealth to one person may be poverty to another. As people have often noted, to a man dying in a desert canyon, bags of gold are worthless. He needs the water of life. Paul tells us in this passage, first of all, what is not important to him anymore, and that is his status as a Jew. All those things which he once valued and held very dear and very important. His high birth as a Jew. His career as a Pharisee. All of these things he has given up. And Paul uses two very important metaphors in the first several verses here to, to show us how he now regards these things. The first is the business metaphor of profit and loss. What he once considered profitable, now he considers a loss. It is now a liability, no longer an asset. Amen. And then Amen. Paul uses a very, very striking and vivid metaphor. He says, I consider all these things of the past refuge. The ancient cities were much different from our modern cities. They, they had no garbage collection and they had no sewage. So all the garbage of the house, all the human excrement were simply thrown out the window into the streets. There to form together a stinking, rotting muck, which the Greeks called scubalon. The exact word that Paul has used here in verse 8. All the things of his past that were so valuable to him, so important to him, that other people would consider very important, Paul considers no better than the filth of the streets. What he 
does value is what I want to focus on tonight, verses 10 and 11. What is valuable to him now? Paul says, I gave all this up in order that I might know Christ. Amen. Amen. What does it mean to know Christ? Well, we've had that already very well explained to us, not only in the sermon, but in the discussion. But I just want to mention a couple of things. It is important that we understand when Paul is referring to knowing Christ, it is not so much that I know Christ, but that he knows me. Not so much that I know God, but that God through Christ knows me. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, if anybody loves God, that man has been known by God. In chapter 13, he says, I shall be someday known. Or someday in the second coming, I shall know, even as now, I am known by God. Amen. And in Galatians, chapter 4, verse 9, he writes to the Galatians, Formerly, in times past, when you were pagans, you did not know God, but now you know him. Or rather, I should say, you are known by God. Mm -hmm. Then he said something similar here in Philippians 3.12. He says, I now press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus has taken hold of me. Yeah. Amen. It is not so much that I come to know God for Christ, but that he knows me, that I am known. Why does Paul say it this way? Because Paul always is emphasizing that the initiative is God's and not ours. I did not search throughout the cosmos to find God. It's found me. I didn't climb the highest mountain to seek him out somewhere. He has stooped to the lowest hell of his earth to search for me. The initiative is always God's. It's never been mine from all eternity. It also speaks about God's election. A scary word for Camelite, said Jesus. <laughs> and yet it's a biblical term. It is very biblical. Paul writes, Whom he foreknew, he predestined. Amen. Amen. Right. Now, I'm Armenian, like most of you here. I believe it was a class predestination, a class election. All those were the class of believers were elected to be saved. Amen. Amen. But God knew every individual in the class before we ever existed. It is not so much that I know God, but that I am known by Him. What it, mean, what it means to know Christ, or to know God through Christ, is to know Him personally. The God that Paul proclaims, the God that Paul knows through Christ, is not the God of the philosophy. He's not the God of the Oriental religions. He is not the uncaused cause or the prime mover or all those terms that the great Greek philosophers have used for God. The way to understand what Paul means by God, as indeed almost everything he writes, is to understand the Old Testament. The Old Testament to know God, to know Yahweh, meant first of all to know his ways, his statutes. Secondly, to come to confess him as God. As the prophets say, then you will know that I am Yahweh when you see these mighty works. And thirdly, it meant to know him as a person, to establish a personal relationship with him. There are many texts that support this, but the classic one, I think, is Jeremiah 24 7, where God speaks through Jeremiah and he says, I will give them a heart to know me that I am Yahweh. They will be my people. I will be their God, for they will return to me with all their hearts. There is an emotional involvement in knowing God. Amen. That we return to him with all our hearts. Knowing Christ, knowing God through Christ involves all of these things. But it is primarily emotional involvement and the intimacy of knowing a person. We live in an age of 
separation and isolation. We live in an age of high tech, which is making high touch more and more difficult. It's easier day by day to go through our routine without touching another human being. And I think this is creating a psyche of separation and alienation. And those existentialist philosophers, although they are atheists, are very perceptive about being able to feel what we feel in our, in our society. They're very sensitive people. One such writer named Arthur Adamoff has written, quote, I feel this overarching and this profound sense of separation. I don't know what I'm separated from, he says. I only know I feel separated and alienated. A recent self-help book on positive thinking of all things advised its readers, you came into the world alone. You will go out alone. Never expect anyone to be there for you. It's this kind of sight, this kind of feeling that permeates now our society. It's no wonder. Paul was willing to consider his past no better than filth in the street. And know the risen Lord, the eternal word, the Son of God, in a personal relationship. But knowing Christ brings three results, and these are the three results that Paul mentions here. These are, these are the riches <laughs> of the knowledge of God. The first result is that Paul has come to know the power. Christ is the omnipotent one who had walked this earth in the power of the Spirit. He cast out demons. He performed many miracles, healing people. He was even able to harness the winds of the cosmos. And when he was raised from the dead, he said that his disciples, all authority has been given to me. Christ's resurrection has unleashed tremendous power to the believers. Amen. After his resurrection, the Bible says he ascended on high and he took captive the forces of evil and he gave spiritual gifts to men. Ephesians chapter 4. Therefore, Paul can pray that the eyes of the Ephesian believers be opened, quote, to know what is the hope of Christ's calling, to know the wealth of his glorious inheritance and the tremendous greatness of his power. To you who believe according to the working of God's mighty strength, which he worked in Christ. When he raised him from the dead. Amen. Paul wants the official believers to know the same power that God worked in Jesus Christ when he raised him from the dead. His power. The power of Christ's resurrection is equal to the power of the Holy Spirit. It is the Spirit that Christ has sent as his advocate. As his successor. As Jesus said to the apostles before his ascension, you will receive power from on high after I have ascended, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. This power is opposed to the forces of sin and death, which were also let loose on the world when Adam sinned. There is therefore a cosmic apocalyptic battle which rages between the power of evil and the power of God. What is this power specifically? It is transforming power, it is protecting power, it is reviving power. Transforming power. God's power is present in our lives by His Holy Spirit to bring about our gradual renewal and change. Thus Paul can write in Romans 15, 13, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in faith so that you abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You can write in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, I pray that God may grant you to be strengthened with power in your innermost being by the Holy Spirit, being rooted and grounded in love. And in Colossians 1.11, he says, We pray that you will be Empowered with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have endurance and patience. Joy, love, peace, patience, and endurance. These are the qualities that the power of Christ's resurrection brings into 
our lives, to bring about our transformation. It is secondly the protecting power. That is protection, it is the power of demons and of Satan. Paul writes in Colossians 2.15, after Christ's resurrection, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities of our age and exhibited them as a public spectacle, triumphing over them. Amen. Christ's resurrection brought victory over Satan, Amen. which Amen. only awaits the full consummation. Amen. Thus the power of the resurrection is present in the life of believers as a power of protection. So that Peter can write in 1 Peter 1, 5, we are shielded by God's power. And Paul can urge the Ephesian believers to put on the armor of God as protection against the devil. Amen. The power of the resurrection is protecting power. It is also reviving power. That is to say, for the Christian, it will bring about his own ultimate victory over death. The clearest expression of this is Romans 6 5. If we have been joined with him in the likeness of his death, that is through baptism, then we will surely participate in Christ's resurrection. There is a union between Christ and the believer that results in the believer sharing in the work and the victory of Christ. Amen. God's power that is present for the believer concretely. We know we are daily being transformed. We know we are daily being protected. It is also present to us in hope. <coughs> because we believe in the ultimate consummation when the forces of evil will be completely destroyed. Amen. Amen. And our own immortal bodies will be made. Our own mortal bodies will be made in food. Amen. The second result of knowing Christ is Paul. The second part of his riches is that he comes to know the fellowship. Christians know that the riches of our faith are not only measured in great triumphs and emotional highs, in suffering with and for the Lord, there is added great depth of understanding and great joy in spite of pain. And this too, says Paul, is part of the surpassing greatness of knowing Christ. That is why Paul says he was willing to give up all the things of his past, all of his status, and consider it no better than street film. To know the fellowship of Christ's sufferings. Now this aspect of the Christian life is both objective and subjective. It's both instantaneous and a process. It is objective and instantaneous in that the Christian through baptism dies with Christ and is crucified with him. Paul writes in Romans 6, 3, don't you know that as many as were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death. Even more vivid is the passage in Galatians 2, 19 and 20. I have been crucified with Christ, Amen. writes Paul. Amen. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. And then the text in Colossians. You've died with Christ from the elemental spirits of the world. And again in Colossians, you died, and your life has been hidden with Christ in God. Amen. Amen. The objective change and conversion is so radical and so complete that the most appropriate <coughs> metaphor to describe it is death. You die. This death is a death to sin, to the power of sin. The death is not only a death to sin, it's a death with Christ. There is an objective union and communion with the Lord who has died and risen. Some, for want of a better term, have called this union a mystical union. Perhaps the words supernatural or, or spiritual union are better, but at any rate, there is an objective change that takes place at baptism which identifies the believer supernaturally with the work of the risen Lord. Amen. 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 The death we die is also subjective and is therefore process. 
I love the, the words of F.W. Beer in his little, excellent little commentary on Philippians. He writes, quote, in the mystical unity with Christ, which was inaugurated in baptism, the Christian was made one with Christ in his suffering and death and in his triumph over death. In the sufferings of his faithful follower, Christ makes himself one with the sufferer, so that our sufferings become his sufferings. In quote. The death that I die of Christ is subjectively the sufferings I experience day by day. Thus Peter can write to a group of Christians enduring a fiery trial in 1 Peter chapter 4. Rejoice when you share in Christ's suffering. Amen. Amen. And Paul instructs the readers in Romans chapter 8. If we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If we suffer with him in order to be glorified. Amen. There's a passage in Colossians that's very striking. Chapter 1, verse 24. Paul writes, Now I rejoice in suffering on your behalf, and I fill up what is lacking in the afflictions of Christ. The sufferings we endure day by day are part of the sufferings that Christ endured. And therefore, a deeper bond of fellowship with Christ becomes interwoven into the fabric of the Christian's life when he suffers. Now, this is not speculative theology on Paul's part. It's not ivory tower theology. This is real experience for Paul. He describes his own everyday experiences several places. One striking place is 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. He writes, In every way we're afflicted, but we're not crushed. We're uncertain, but we're not in despair. We're persecuted, but we're not abandoned. We're cast down, but we're not destroyed. I always bear the death of Jesus in my body. In Galatians 6.17, Paul says, From now on, let no one give me trouble. For I bear the marks of Jesus on my body. Amen. Paul is here, and these two passages surely referring to the scars, the broken bones, the beaten down body that he has known as a result of years of physical abuse and deprivation, but simply living a life of a Christian and an apostle. He lists some of these sufferings in 2 Corinthians 11, imprisonment, flogging, beatings, stoning, shipwreck, sleepless labor, hunger, cold, and emotional stress. And all these things are now for Paul riches part of the wealth of knowing Christ, part of the surpassing greatness that are false. Even suffering is shared with a risen Lord who you know has a sweetness and a joy in God. I love the testimony that was given by Corey Ten Boom, who suffered enormously in a Nazi concentration camp in the Second World War because of what her family tried to do to save the lives of, of Jews that were being persecuted. She said that while she was in a concentration camp, it was absolutely horrible, of course, but she said, we felt a kind of sad joy. And she went on to say, I have never been closer to the Lord than I was during that yet joyful period of time. I'd like to mention this evening just uh, very quickly one way in which Christian servants need to share Christ's sufferings. We have known, of course, many great martyrs and confessors, and I, I thank God for the courage of the sacrifice. But I have a feeling for this group, for this crowd, what I'm about to say is I refer to the emotional pain and stress of criticism, misunderstanding, and false rumors which so many servants of the Lord have had to suffer because they 
sought to do something great for him. I used to think that these kind of things were abnormal in the ministry. That has not, however, been my experience. And from reading the lives of people like to consider great Christian servants, such as Chuck Swindoll, David Wilkerson, Robert Schuller, from reading about these people and their experiences, it appears to me that perhaps unfair criticism and misunderstanding are the norm, not the exception. For anyone who would seek to do something exceptional for Christ. Ron Davis has written a very insightful book entitled Mentoring. And he writes, misunderstanding and criticism are inevitable features in the life of anyone who would attempt anything worthwhile for God. End quote. He goes on to give several examples of this kind of thing, and then he, he says something I think is very significant. It doesn't matter what happens to us, but our reaction to what happens to us is vitally important to Amen. And when we see our, our pain, our suffering, as part of the suffering of Christ, when we see ourselves living out day by day, Christ suffering, then our reaction will be to hope for one. Let us use our suffering, even the painful sting of, of criticism and misunderstanding, as an occasion for strengthening the bond between us and the Lord. Amen. We must Amen. be willing, not only to march with him in his glory, but to kneel with him in the garden. He will certainly not only wear a crown, but will bear a cross. Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote in his very important book in 1936 called The Cost of Discipleship. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. And this for Paul was his well. The third result of knowing Christ, says Paul, is that he will attain to the resurrection of the dead, his own resurrection the dead in the last day. The specter of death, as our good brother who spoke before me made clear, hangs over everything in his life. And for the unbeliever, it threatens to destroy the life that they have. Life seems to be negated, invalidated by the fact that it must someday end. This has been a theme. This has been the way people have fought for millennia. It was no different in Paul's day than it is in ours. I think of the, the very interesting story that we have in, in Plato's Republic of this man. Uh, his name was Cephalus. He's talking to the Greek philosopher Socrates. Cephalus is aging, and now he's beginning to think of death. He says every night he has nightmares because he's afraid he's going to die and go to the underworld, and he's afraid of all the torments and the sufferings that lie ahead of him. I think of a very interesting sculpture I saw once. It stood originally in a cemetery in Athens. It's now in a museum. It's a sculpture of a young woman who has died. She's about to be escorted to the underworld. And there standing on the other side is her husband and her two small children who reach out to her in horror in absolute terror because she's being taken from her. It is a picture of despair and hopelessness. Now Paul could not have been insensitive to these feet, the so permeated the world in which he lived. It is true he was a Pharisee and he believed dogmatically and doctrinally in the resurrection, in the general resurrection at the last day. It's true there are some passages in the Old Testament and seem to support this. But the Sadducees had their own interpretation of these passages. Paul is not just a Jew, he's a Jew who came from outside of Palestine who was well aware of pagan thought. How could he be sure? He could not have been insensitive and unaware of his feelings. How could he know for sure they would be a resurrection? And then, on the road to Damascus, he met the wisdom. Paul was certainly not inclined ever to believe that Jesus of Nazareth, that poor 
carpenter, the ones who had been executed as the vilest of criminals, would be raised from the dead. But he was certain that he had met the risen Lord. And now he was sure. Now he was sure that he too would be raised because his Lord had been raised. It is no wonder that Paul was willing to give up everything. His station as a high-born Jew, his status, his career as a Pharisee, perhaps even his wealth. And he now considers it no better than the off-scourings of the street, that he might know Christ, the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, and attain the resurrection of the dead. T.S. Eliot wrote in 1925, two years before his conversion, the following words of despair. This is the way the world ends. Not with a fame, but with a whimper. In Christ, however, there is no whimper. Amen. Only the shout of triumph. Amen. Amen. O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? Thanks be to God who gives us the victory. Amen. Through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This is Paul's wealth. These are his riches that he has known in knowing God through Jesus Christ. Paul gave up a lot, apparently. I sometimes wonder if I could have given up all that. But he's not the only one that's ever sacrificed. I want to just mention one person, and we sang the song that he, uh, that he helped Paul just a few minutes ago. His name was George Beverly Shea. George Beverly Shea is well known to everyone as. Uh, great gospel singer the all company story Graham. As a young man, George Beverly Shea was offered a very lucrative contract to sing on public radio, sing secular songs on the radio. It was a break he'd been longing for for years. Lots of people, thousands of young men would have given their right arms for that opportunity, and to top it all, it was in the 30s. Jobs of any kind were hard to come by. Only one thing held him back. He, he had been pondering what it meant to give himself completely to the war. His mother found the poem that became a hymn and put this poem on the piano so that he could see it as he played it. As he read through that poem on one evening, his decision became final. He turned down the contract and he went on to become a gospel singer and he wrote the music words of this great hymn. I'd rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather have Jesus than riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or lands. I'd rather be led by his nail-pierced hand. 